I've been doing the uh, series on Christi Christian cults, right? Christ I have to put Christian in quotes because they're, they're not really Christian, but uh, they call themselves Christian, so we call them Christian cults. And we're, we're, I'm not really taking a break from it, but there's a, a subject covered that I didn't cover last week when I went over the Jehovah's False Witness cult. And um, it, was, it was significant enough, it's a significant enough doctrine that I wanted to kind of cover the whole thing. And, and really go more in depth into this one topic because it is, it is such a key doctrine. It is so important. And they're actually not the only ones that, um, that even hold to this. And that's the doctrine of hell. Hell being a real place, a literal place, a place that we know to be in the heart of the earth, in the center of the earth, a place that even science will tell you is fire and brimstone and sulfur and, you know, it's really, really hot at the core of the, of the earth. We know this. Science tells us this. The Bible's already told us this. We know this to be a fact. And that we don't believe in soul sleep. We don't believe in annihilation. We, know, we believe that people either go to heaven or they go to hell. When you die, when you breathe your last breath, your soul is going to be in one of the two places. Amen. And that's it. There is no in-between. There's no purgatory. They're not going to be sleeping in the ground. It's one or the other. Now, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm going to read this quote for you. This, this, the sermon isn't all about Jehovah's Witnesses, but I am going to be bringing up a couple of things here. And um, I, was, I was literally, I mean, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. The guy I was speaking to at Soul Wedding today didn't show up because I was, he, he, he brought up this thing about hell. And we're going to get into it, but he was just saying that, you know, I believe God's a God of justice. And, you know, a just God isn't going to send someone to hell forever and ever and ever you know, if they, if, they brought, if they were, you know, living in Saudi Arabia or some place where they've just been brought up with a false religion, that's all they've ever known. And he's like, <laughs> he points to his daughter. He's like, you know, if I just kept her locked inside and never allowed her out of the house and she never had contact with anyone else and she only knew what I told her and she didn't ever hear about Jesus, you know what I mean? Like this whole thing of like, well, a just God won't send this person to hell. And... Unfortunately, we were, he, he kind of talked a lot. I wasn't able to get um, nailed down to any one line of thinking, so I didn't spend too much time with him. But um, I told him, I was like, man, I'm preaching about hell tonight. Like, come tonight. I'm going to be, oh, these things that you're bringing up, I actually already have answers for. I'm going to show you from Scripture, you know, like there's, there's, there's so much evidence that hell is a real place and that God can still be a God of justice the way that you don't, are misunderstanding justice and coming up with your own justice and how all of this stuff works. But I'm going to, before I, before I get too ahead of myself, because I do have those points and, and we've got scripture to, to show that, um, I'm going to read for you um, a quote on what Jehovah's Witnesses believe about hell, because this ties in with the, the sermon against the Jehovah's False Witnesses. So here's what it says. This is what we believe. There is no eternal torment in a fiery hell. That's their statement. Because that's what real Christians believe. That there is a place called hell that is eternal torment. It lasts forever and ever, and it's fiery. It's full of fire and brimstone. So here it says, and this is their explanation. Now, I got this statement from JW.org. Okay, I'm not... I'm not even citing an author or someone who came out of that religion. I mean, this is, if you go to their website, this is what you will see. This is their position on hell. So they say, quoting from Romans 6.23 in the King James Version, Zion's watchtower, entitled its issue of June 1882, The Wages of Sin is Death, right, of course, Romans 6, 23. Um, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sorry about the brain fart. <laughs> the wages of sin is death, right? And that's that, and I just read, the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, they say, stating, how clear and simple is this statement? You say, how clear and simple it is this? The wages of sin is death. How strange it is that so many who profess to receive the Bible as the word of God persist in contradicting 
this positive statement and affirm that they believe and that the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is everlasting life in torment. So what they're, what they're saying is, oh, it's so simple. The wages of sin is death. We're all going to die. And that that's it. And that that's their punishment is that the physical death on this earth is everything, the, the full payment for your sins. That that's it. That it's not an ever, you know, and, and they, they like to use one verse. They don't go through any of the other arguments, right? If you have a disagreement on scripture or something, you say, well, present your side, you know, and, and you say, well, what about this and 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 this all the, the times that hell is mentioned in the Bible and, and judgment and, and, you know, everything else. And the wrath of God, God's wrath happens when you have a heart attack. I mean, does that really sound like God's right? You know, there's so many things. But they don't go into any of that because they just want to use the one verse. See, the wages of death, that's it. And I don't see how, I don't see how anyone could possibly think it's everlasting torture or torment. Yeah, you won't be able to see that when you don't read the whole Bible. I mean, or you're just talking to people that want to hear only one thing. And see, this is with Charles Taze Russell. The reason why, one of the reasons why, he, he grew up, and I mentioned this before, he grew up, I think, Presbyterian which has a perfectly normal understanding of hell being a punishment for sins. And he didn't, that is the, like the big sticking thing with him that he didn't like. So as he was searching for basically someone else that can tell him, oh yeah, we don't believe in hell either. He found this uh, barber, I think his name was, was an Adventist preacher. Uh, I believe it was a second Adventist is what they were, was what this, the group was called that this guy, he followed, like, oh yeah, we don't believe in this either. And just a little teaser, next week we'll be going into the seventh Adventist church is another cult is going to be on my cult list. So this is a perfect segue because they also have weird views of, you know, a soul sleep and with hell and things like that. So this kind of is a good link between those two cults. And actually they come out about the same time in, in the 1800s and very similar beliefs in many regards and very different in other regards. So um, that's next week. So stay tuned for that. But they make this one statement. Say, oh, yeah, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. Yeah, except they don't want to go to Ezekiel 31 like we started off reading in today because death is more than just a physical event that happens. There's more to death than just a physical death. If, you, know, you could refer, you know, a death is a word you have to understand in context because it can just refer to a physical death. If, if you were to say, when, when my body, when my flesh dies, to say that Pastor Burzum's died, you know, that in, in, in that regard, that's a true statement. But I have everlasting life. So even though my flesh has died, my soul and my spirit are still alive and will be alive and are alive forevermore. That could refer to that death. But death, there's a second death. There's a death of the soul. There's a place where people are that is, is where the dead are. And what we read in Ezekiel 31 is that there is a place called death. And we see the same thing in Revelation. So look at verse 14 of Ezekiel 31. The Bible reads, To the end that none of all the trees by the waters shall exalt, excuse me, by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. So it says there that they are delivered unto death and then it clarifies that by saying to the nether parts of the earth. And nether just means lower. It's the lower parts of the earth. Now, anyone who knows anything about how big the earth is, I mean, even just a real simple understanding. And even, you know what? I don't even care if you believed in a flat earth, which is stupid anyways. But just science itself of what we know today of people drilling down into the earth and, you know, not coming out the, the end of the, the flat earth or whatever, whatever. I, I don't know how thick they think it is or whatever. Doesn't matter. I don't want to get off on that stupid subject. But, 
But the lower parts of the earth, we know that, you know, science is going to tell you that we have this crust of the earth, which is what we know to be like the ground. And we, you know, when people are buried in the grave six feet under the ground and stuff like that, that is like, that is the surface of the earth. Six feet under the ground is the surface of the earth. With the immense depth of the, of the earth, the deepness, how far you can actually go down, the thousands of feet and miles that just continue to go down, 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 down towards the center, that's really deep. So when you're talking about the lower parts of the earth, lower is not a few feet off the surface. Lower, you know, because that's what they want to call. They want to equate hell with the grave. Just the common grave of mankind. mankind. That's what they call it. They refer to hell as just, oh, that's just talking about people dying. Really? Then why is hell even used then? And they'll say, but what they'll say is that's a mistranslation. It's incorrect. That's what they say. But it's not incorrect. They, and and I, don't know, I don't know if I have it in my notes, actually. I don't think I do with Hades and Gehenna and, um, you know, the different words, the, the foreign words that are used to translate. But I, I brought this up last week, I think. You know, even Hades, for anyone who's, who's learned a little bit, because for whatever reason, you know, when, when you're in public school, they like to teach you about pagan religions and, and Greek mythology and Roman mythology and stuff like that. You still end up learning about these false gods. I don't know why or they're not supposed to be teaching religion, right. right? But they're okay teaching you about Zeus and Jupiter and Saturn and whatever, like that they believed in all this, this nonsense. So um, if you know anything about Hades, I mean, even in Greek, a Greek speaking person is going to know what Hades is. And it's an underworld. It's not, it's not a place where it's just physical death and there's nothing. It is a spiritual death place. Now, it may not be exactly what the Bible calls, like refers to as being hell or described as being hell perfectly, but you get the understand. I mean, you get the, the meaning of the word. It's not just referring to a physical death. It's not just referring to a separation from God, which is why it's so torturous and tormenting because you're just not with God. Well, I mean, you're not with God right now, like in his presence before his throne either. So does that mean we're in hell? Of course not. Hell is a completely different place. So anyways, we see that in Ezekiel 31, and this is a very good place to show that death is referred to as being a place. Death is referred to as being in the nether parts of the earth. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, this is Jesus Christ speaking, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. He has the keys. Your keys unlock a place. I have the keys of hell. It's unlocking hell and of death because death is the location. I have the keys of death. I'll be able to open it up. He was bound and led captive into death when he died, after he died on that cross and was bearing the sins of the whole world and went to hell to pay for our sins. And yeah, we're going to get into that too. And then when he resurrected, he came back, he conquered death and hell. He has the keys of death and hell as written in Revelation chapter 1. And then even in Revelation chapter 20, another indication. We use this all the time out soul I don't know about you. I always do um, about death being a place. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They're coming up out of death. They're coming up out of hell. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So at judgment day, after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, there is going to be a final judgment, the great white throne judgment, where the Lord is sitting on his throne, and the books are open, and the book of life is open, and every man's judged according to their works, went all the dead. Now, you are not considered dead and won't be standing before that great white throne judgment if you're born again, if you're saved, because you have everlasting life, which is why the, the, the Bible is very clear to say the dead. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. The dead are referred to as being dead. Jesus Christ said, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham's not dead because he's alive, because he has eternal life, because he's in heaven. He's not in his own bosom. He's in heaven. 
which that's a good point. If people believe in, want to believe in Abraham's bosom being a place, yeah. well, if Abraham's bosom is a place, then where's Abraham? <laughs> I mean, he's greater than his bosom, isn't he? Is there, everyone else is inside of Abraham's bosom. Um, I'm just teasing. I, I'm, I'm making fun of a silly doctrine. It's, it really is silly. But, um, so we see in a few places that death can be referring to something other than just your physical death on this earth. I mean, we see that very clear in the language that's being used. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is a real event. The lake of fire is a real place. Amen. Hell is going to be relocated into the lake of fire. I believe hell and death are synonymous. Hell and death are the same place, and they are both going to be cast into the lake of fire. So when you read verses, and you don't, make, don't let this worry you, um, as the lake of fire being a separate place, which it is. The lake of fire is a separate place from hell. But when you read the verses about people being, you know, suffering eternally in hell, well, they are suffering eternally in hell. Just because hell has been relocated to another place that's also fiery doesn't mean that they're not going to be in hell, whether it's you die now and you go to hell or you get cast into the lake of fire where hell is, you're going to be in hell there too. It's not, it's, not, it's not a problem or a contradiction or a reason for concern. You could still be experiencing everlasting hell, you know, with that one moment of being standing before the great white throne and then going right back into hell, which is now located in the, in the lake of fire, since there's going to be a new heaven and new earth anyway. So hell has to go somewhere because the first heaven and first earth are going to be destroyed. They're going to be done away with. So let's see here. J uh, So the judgment for sin is death, right? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. It's a, it's a very accurate statement, but it's not the same way that they're describing it. Um, it can't be the way that the JWs define it. The concept of a soul and spirit is critical for this understanding also. And remember, we spent a lot of time last week kind of debunking their... And you can't even figure out what their belief is on the soul. Because we read verses out of their New World Translation that said, the blood is the soul, the body is the soul, and the, the life is the soul. Three different things. Completely different things. Because they don't like, you know, the life is in the blood. They say the, you know, and they say the soul is in the blood. And it's, it's these weird statements. We went over that. Like, if you didn't hear that, catch my sermon last week. I'm not going to re-preach all of that. But... I think one of the reasons they also have to do that is because of all the verses that talk about your soul being tortured and tormented in hell. In Genesis chapter 2, turn if you would to, um, man, I got so many verses. I'm going to be flying through most of these. Turn if you would to Hosea 9. Turn if you would to Hosea 9. I'm going to read for you from Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, of course, we have God placing Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? And he gives them one commandment. He says, you know, of all the trees of the garden, you could freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that thou mayest not eat. You can't eat that one tree. And, um, of course, Satan deceives Eve. Eve eats. Then Adam also eats. And, you know, the curse comes. But here's what God said when he gave them that commandment. In Genesis 2.16, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now when God makes a statement like that, do you think he's just going to be wrong? Or do you think he's going to be meaning something else? No, he's, you know, when God said, The day, the day, that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Now, Satan tried to tell them, you're not surely going to die, and cast doubt on God's word. Now, did Adam and Eve die physically when they ate of the fruit? No. There is no record of that in the Bible. They didn't fall down dead and, well, they're dead. That's death. See, that's the wages of their sin. They physically died, and that's it, and they're gone. No, 
That wasn't the wage of their sin. Actually, now, did they die? You better believe they died. But it wasn't a physical death. What was it? Spiritual death. Which is why we need to be born again. That's why we need to have a spiritual birth. As Jesus said in John chapter 3, so that we're born again, so we could have life, so we could have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the eternal life that he's talking about also is not this flesh. Now, this flesh will be changed, but it's not this body that's just this flesh to just live forever on this earth. We receive eternal life the moment we believe because our spirit is born again, because that's our spirit that died the moment we sinned. The Apostle Paul wrote, you know, I was alive once without the law, but when the law came, sin revived and I died. Basically describing that whatever, whenever you get to, it, to the age of accountability, and again, I'm not going to go into detail on that. No one knows exactly when that happens for each person. Doesn't matter. There is a point in everybody's life where God's going to hold you responsible to understand right from wrong and understand that there's a law and understand that there's a God and understand that you're sinning against God. Very simply. Romans chapter 1 explains how creation even shows us that, you know, we're without excuse because the creation shows God who he is and we are without excuse. So he's given us enough. And not only that, I mean, he's given us so much more than creation. He's, he's given us a light. He's given us his word. He's given us people that are already saved to go out and preach the word. You know, I mean, there, there's so many things, but regardless, I digress. Um, they did definitely die, but it wasn't a physical death. It was a spiritual death. And the day that his spirit died, his soul was doomed. That was the wages of Adam's sin. Now the question comes up, and this is what you'll frequently hear when you speak to Jehovah's Witnesses or anyone else who doesn't like the concept of hell is they'll say, would a loving God send anyone to hell? That's always a big thing. They'll say, well, God is love. And they like to quote that from 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's the verse. And that's what they're saying. Well, God is love. And would a loving God send anyone to hell? Yeah, actually, a loving God would. And, um, but he's not loving the person that he's sending to hell. Just because God is love doesn't mean he loves everybody. God you know, can be described as love. God has love. God is love. But it doesn't mean that that is applied to every single person all the time. Um, would that mean then if God is love in, in the way that they want to present it? And, and, and think about these things and remember these things because if someone comes to you with this and, you, and they're, they're willing to have a discussion, like I mentioned previously, the whole point of going through most of these exercises and point out the cults is so that we can speak to them and give them the gospel and get them saved and try to reason with them and show them from Scripture why they're wrong. But if you think about this, if someone wants to give you that, well, God is love, so hell can't be real, you say, well then, just because God is love, does that mean he doesn't have wrath? Is there no anger, is there no wrath with God? Because that is extremely easy to show wrong if someone wants to say, well, because God is love, there is no anger, there is no wrath, there is no judgment. False. You can't have the statement, God is love, and still have a God that has wrath and anger. They're not two opposing, it's not a contradiction. Whether you can understand it or not, there is a wrath to come. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sound familiar, right? Another verse. I know I typically use out soul winning quite a bit. But then verse 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God has wrath. I mean, John 3.36 Right? He that believeth not the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son hath not, Lord, hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God. God's anger. 
1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Is God love? Yes. Does God have wrath? Yes. And you have to ask yourself, does it even make sense to say, oh, we're delivered from the wrath to come, the extreme anger of God. And that extreme anger is only found in our physical death that everybody experiences. Again, that can't be true if it's just delivering us from our physical death because everyone dies, even believers. I mean, even Jehovah's Witnesses physically die. Were they delivered from the wrath to come? Now, again, they, they want to, and this is, this is you, you get a little bit of an insight as to why they have to come up with even weirder and weirder doctrines. Because when you start challenging them on these things, then they have to come up, just imagine something else. Well, when you die, I know I said the wages of sin is death, and that's real simple. But when you die, you're actually, your soul, you're just asleep. You're just unconscious until that final judgment, which then is the wrath of God. And then you're just completely annihilated and destroyed and cease to exist. Wait a minute. So am I made conscious again and then made unconscious again? And that's the wrath of God? Why would he have to, to bring me up out of my sleep to put me back into sleep again? I mean, it makes no sense. Oh, but this time it's forever. Okay, I had no idea that it wasn't forever when I was asleep because according to them, when you die, there is just, there's no consciousness, there's no soul, there's nothing going on. So what's the point? The point is they're trying to fit, make something fit in Scripture that doesn't, that's not there. They're trying to just come up with a, with a way to explain things away and it doesn't work. It, 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 it makes no sense. You're in Hosea chapter 9. You know, God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but there comes a time when God will love people no more. And we find this exact phrase in Hosea 9. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. <gasps> God's love, he doesn't hate. For there, I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Yes, there are people that God loves no more. Mm -hmm. Amen. Did God so love the world? He sure did. Does God love every precious life that comes into this world? Absolutely. But there gets a point where he loves them no more. And guess what happens when he loves you no more? You got his wrath on you. Amen. Because God is a long-suffering and merciful God. And God will love people for a really long time and want them to have every opportunity and want them to get saved and want them to believe on Jesus Christ and just want them to be with him forever. But there gets a point where he says, fine, I'm going to love you no more. And that's it. They're done. God hates some people. So if you go to Isaiah 55, you're in Hosea, just turn back to Isaiah 55. I'm going to read for you from Leviticus chapter 26. I mean, going all the way back to Old Testament law. Leviticus 26, verse 27, the Bible says, And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me. So for all, if you still won't listen unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. That word abhor is about as strong of a word as I could think of for hate. If you really, really, really hate someone, you're going to use the word abhor. I abhor you. Going to God's soul, he says, my soul shall abhor you. 
Now, I, I have no idea what Jehovah's Witnesses think is God's soul. <laughs> because sometimes they say man is a soul, a living soul. That's what they talk about. You know, like our body, our flesh. Well, what about God's soul? Well, that's different. I, I didn't even think to look that up. That's funny. I'll have to look that up later. Mental note. I know the New World Transla Translation won't even say soul there because they have to cover up everything about that. But no, God hates. When we understand it, when we, when we realize this, and don't just accept the, the, the image of God that this world wants to present to you, that the God-haters want to present to you, that the reprobates want to present to you, that, oh, God's loving, God loves me, you have to love me, you just have to tolerate everything I do because God's going to accept me no matter what and, and, and he loves me for everything and coming up with their own God and, and want to, to, to just wallow in their filth and, and promote their wickedness and get you to accept and get you to call good evil and evil good. They made up their own God. It's not the God of the Bible. You're in Isaiah chapter 55. How is it justice, is what they'll say, how is it justice for a person to be tortured and tormented forever and ever and ever for something they did one time? And this is that com another common argument. You say, well, so if I just told one lie, I deserve to be punished? I mean, forever and ever and ever? And this is, this is kind of more to the point that the, the guy I was talking to today was going with that is like, he was saying like, how would that be justice? Because we think of like, you know, if you, if you commit a crime, there is a punishment associated with that. And of course, we know that there's bigger crimes and worse crimes. There's big sins. There's little sins, right? And we know this and, and, I, and you can't deny it. All sin is not equal. All sin is not the same. There is definitely categories of sin. There's big sins, worse sins. But God's judgment on that sin is still just. It's still right. There's still equity there. See, when we deal with, with people breaking laws on this earth, we have a certain sense of justice. We should. I mean, the Bible, God's given us that sense of justice of how we deal with people for crimes that are committed in this lifetime, on this earth, between people. The law that God's established where we, at, we commit crimes against one another, whether it be stealing, you know, theft, whether it be um, adultery, whether it be rape, kidnapping, whatever, right? any of the laws where people are transgressing against someone else, that is mankind sinning against mankind. And he's given us what's just between us. That is not the exact same justice that goes between us and God. Between us and the Creator. When we sin against God, we are breaking his rules and his commandments. And he determines what is right and what is wrong. And just because you may not understand why, if you were to just tell one lie in this lifetime, that God would send you to a place of eternal torture and torment? It doesn't mean that that's not the way that God made things. So here's the thing with God. God makes up all of the rules. And either the Holy Bible is the word of God or it's not. If this is not the word of God, we've got a really miserable existence. Because if this is not the word of God, then there is no God. But this is the word of God. We know that this is the word of God. And if this is the word of God, then we just have to look at these words and understand who God is. Not try to make God fit our image of who he should be, but who is he? In Isaiah chapter 55, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God understands way more than we do and knowing and understanding a proper balance and equity in judgment, he knows way more than we do. And this is what, you know, people have the hard time understanding. How could a God send someone to hell forever and ever and ever and ever after doing only one thing? But they don't seem to have a hard time then balancing the scales on the other side of saying, well, how can a just God offer forgiveness? And just pardon, like he says here, have mercy upon and abundantly pardon. How would that not be unjust? How come that doesn't spoil your perception of how just God is to just forgive people? No one has a problem with that. But you see, there's your balance. As freely as he's offering a pardon to you, complete wiping away of sins, the other extreme is eternal judgment and torture and torment and punishment. There is a good balance there. But see, God understands this, and man has a hard time grasping this concept. That's right. Amen. Fifty-four times the word hell is used in the King James Bible, not including other references to hell using other words. Just the word hell alone is used 54 times. And I actually have, we're going we're gonna to go through, now you don't have to follow, you know, turn to all these places, but we're going to go through all of these. I'm going to stop on a few of them and make some points. But the reason why I'm going to do this and, and what I want you to be paying attention to as I read these verses referencing hell, the way it was translated in the Bible, is to just get the image from Scripture of what hell is. Because the people who don't want to believe it's a place of eternal torture and torment and judgment want to tell you that hell is not really hell. They want to tell you that it's something else, that it's some other event, that it's not really a fiery burning place in the middle of the earth. But we're going to read what the Bible just says about hell and then form our opinion and our understanding of what is hell. Now, the New World Translation in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, um, they have a glossary, and this is what their term is. It says, in one of their places where hell is referenced, like from the King James Bible, they'll say, or Sheol, Sheol. And they say that that is just, it says, or Sheol, that is the common grave of mankind. They define the term Sheol, which the King James Bible will use usually the word hell to describe as translating that. They say, well, that just means a common grave. Just the, com just, just the fact that eh, everybody's going to die. We're all just going to go to the grave. That's their definition. So here's their definition of grave. It says, when lowercase, referring to an individual grave. When capitalized, so in their New World Translation, grave is either going to be capitalized or lowercase. So if it's lowercase, it just means it's talking about someone's specific grave. Right? Like Abraham buried his wife in a grave at Mamre. Right? That would be a lowercase g. It says, when capitalized, the common grave of mankind, equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol and the Greek Hades. It is described in the Bible as a symbolic place or condition wherein all activity and consciousness cease. So it's telling you that this is what, it's just, it's just a symbolic place. It's not a real place, it's symbolic. And what it, what it represents is a condition wherein all activity and consciousness cease no consciousness okay remember that they're saying hell is a place where there's no consciousness and no activity we're going to read some verses where it sounds a little bit more like there's activity and consciousness in hell and they reference some verses i'm not going to take the time tonight because i'm already way over time as far as what i want to cover tonight and, and hit and, and refute these passages. But if you want to look them up later, they're Genesis 47.30, Ecclesiastes 9.10, and Acts 2.31. Yes, Acts 2.31. We're going to look at Acts. They, they really literally think that Acts 2 somehow supports their notion 
that it's a symbolic place where all activity and consciousness cease. Funny that they don't explain how Acts 2.31 supports that. They just throw... But, you know, most people, if you were just to make a statement and throw some verses at the end, like little links like that, they'll just be like, oh, well, the Bible must say that then. Because they're, us they're using Bible to support their argument, so it must just say that. And people just, just blindly accept that instead of actually going to the verses and be like, what does this verse really say? Does it say what they're claiming it says? Uh, no, it doesn't. Ask someone that speaks Greek if the word Hades is just referring to the common grave of mankind. L let me know how that goes. JWs play on ignorance, especially in their translation. They play on people's ignorance. They, they use the Greek and Hebrew words to confuse people instead of even allowing the context to provide the meaning. So they just want to tell you what this means. They say, oh, Sheol, Hades, Gehenna. Right? They use these foreign words that is not common to an English-speaking person and then just says, well, that's what these words mean. Whereas the King James Bible uses the word hell. Why? Because English-speaking people understand what the word means and that is the translation for those words. Amen. It's hell. And you could even get this from the context. So I'm gonna, you, you don't have to follow along. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite each reference, and I'm going to try to read it really quickly because there's so much here. Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a, a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. See if you can kind of catch uh, some consistencies here about what hell is like. 2 Samuel 22, 6, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Job 11, 8, it is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? And you're going to find this contrast between heaven and hell over and over and over again in the 54 references to hell. And guess what? Heaven is always... Up, higher than, above, into heaven. Hell is always going to be low, lower, into the deep, into the pit. That's hell. It's low. It's down. Heaven up, hell down. I know, this is really difficult to grasp. Job 26, 6. Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. See, they'll like a verse like that. Just, see, hell is just destruction, and you're just destroyed, and you see it's this. Well, no, let's keep reading. Let's take the whole. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 16, 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We'll go over this verse when we get to Acts. Psalm 18, 5. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Again, this association between hell and death and hell, and hell being a place of sorrow. Psalm 55, yeah, but there's no activity or consciousness, but it's, it's sorrowful. Psalm 55, 15, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick, go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Psalm 86, 13, for great is thy mercy toward me and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Psalm 116, 3, the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Psalm 139, 8, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Proverbs 5.5 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Proverbs 7.27 Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 9.18 But he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Another great verse. The dead are there. And her guests are in the depths, the depths, the lowest parts of hell. 
This isn't talking about the common grave, my friends. Proverbs 15, 11, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Proverbs 15, 24, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Directions, above, beneath. Proverbs 23, 14, but I, I just don't know where they might come up with this idea that the wages of sin is eternal punishment. I don't, I don't know where that would come. I mean, it's just death. I mean, it's a common grave. People just die. Don't, I don't, couldn't possibly understand where this notion would come from, this silly notion of hell being in the center of the earth and fire and brimstone. Proverbs 23, 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. If this is just a common grave, how can anyone be delivered? Deliver his soul from hell. How can you be delivered? Everybody dies. Oh, it's just a common grave. Bible says some people are delivered from hell. If it's just a common grave, then that means there's some people that never go to the common grave. Wait a minute. When does that happen? I mean, look, th this isn't Highlander. And I apologize if you're too young to understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> this old TV show where, where people were immortal, right? You fight the, the immortals, and the only way that you could, be, you could lose your immortality is if someone chopped your head off with a sword. <laughs> Sorry, I know, it's stupid, but... If there were people, and, and what's funny is because those people were like around for hundreds of years, right? So like they were through all these various ages and time and stuff. Well, if hell was a common grave and we could be delivered from hell, then you'd have people like that walking on this earth. They're, oh yeah, I've been around since the times of Jesus. I mean, I'm delivered from hell, right? Hell's just a common grave. No, because hell's not just a common grave. Proverbs 27, 20, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Isaiah 5, 14, therefore hell hath enlarged herself. Talking about a place getting bigger. The common grave hasn't enlarged herself. I mean, if it's the common grave, it's going to be the same size. Hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Isaiah 14, 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Isaiah 14, 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now what's a pit? What's a pit? It's core, right? We, we, we typically understand a pit when we think about fruit. There's some fruits that have pits. Peaches have a little pit inside, right? At the, where is that? Right in the middle. Is it right on the surface when you start to get the skin off of a, of a peach, you know, the little furry skin? Is that, is that where you find the pit? No, of course, the pit's in the center. Or you can think of a pit as someone who digs a hole, right? And you have a big pit. Now, hell is referred to, and I don't know if we're, I'm not, I know I'm not going to have time to get into this. Hell is referred to as the bottomless pit. And again, that makes sense because the earth is a sphere. Amen. I know this is very, very hard to understand these days. The earth is a sphere or a ball. If you want to bring it down to the level of a child, it's a ball. Okay, I know people love to throw that term around. It's a ball. We live on a ball. And there is a force acting upon us that is preventing us from, if I just jumped up, I don't just keep on going. I come back down to the earth. You know, pay attention, kids. You'll learn something here. Okay? Or if I take my bottle of water and let go, it goes down to the ground, right? Guess what? This same force is upon everyone in the world, no matter where you are on the globe. So if you have a big circle, I wish I had a, a board right now, draw a big circle. You have a force 
you'd have arrows pointing in all the way around, pointing down to the earth, right? And all of those arrows are going to meet right in the center where there's a pit where it's really, really hot. It's not solid. It's too hot for that. And you're going to have forces that are coming in all in the middle. It's a hole. It's at the center. And guess what? There's going to be no gravity there. It is your bottomless pit. There's no bottom to it because it's right in the middle. I don't know what's so hard to understand about that. <laughs> Let's keep reading. I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend all day and, and, and just have the flat earthers just really blow up the, the, the video when, when we post this up online. They're already going to have a field day with it. Let's see. Where was I now? Down to hell. Yeah, we, we, there's so many of these. We were in Isaiah, right? Did we get past Isaiah yet? Uh, all right, I'm just going to pick up reading here. Isaiah 28, 15, Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. I'm going to try to get through a lot of these, like I said. I, I want to make it a point, though, to read every single reference. We're going to read every single reference and, and just get the full picture of what hell is. Isaiah 28, 18, And your covenant with death shall be annulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Isaiah 57, 9, And thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. Ezekiel 31, 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice, and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. And then verse 17, they also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword. And they that are, were his arm that dwelt under a shadow in the midst of the heathen. Again, down into hell. Ezekiel 32, 21, the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, laid by the sword. Well, wait a minute. All activity and consciousness cease in the common grave. Ezekiel 32, 21 says the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell. But there's no speaking or activity in the common grave. Sorry to confuse you with the Bible. Let me, Ezekiel 32, 21, The strong and the, among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell. Why? Because there is consciousness. Why? Because the people are not just going to be speaking. They're going to be wailing and moaning in terror and in pain. And it's going to be dark and it's going to be a horrible place. Because they are conscious. Because it's the worst place imaginable, which is what motivates us to get people saved in the first place. Amen. See, that's one of the big things the JWs are, are totally missing. They go out and try to proselytize and evangelize because they're worried about themselves. They're worried about themselves being one of the 144,000. They're worried about themselves re receiving eternal life on this earth. They don't care about anyone else. We go out and try to win people to Christ because we know that hell's a real place. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. God wasn't just made, using all this colorful language in 54 times in the Bible just to say, oh, it's all symbolism. It's all just symbolism. Pretend like it's not really real. We're just talking about the grave. You know, I just want to confuse you because that's, God's the author of confusion, right? He just wants to confuse you into making it sound like this really, really scary, bad place when really it's, it's just a grave that everyone dies and goes to. No, hell is real, which is why we go out and we try to save people from hell because we don't want their souls going there and God doesn't want their souls going there. But if they die without Christ, God's going to love them no more and that is where they're going to spend eternity. 
Ezekiel 32, 27, and they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. And they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquity shall be upon their bones. Though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Amos 9, 2, though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them up. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. If digging into hell just means six feet under the earth, then climbing up into heaven would just mean climbing a tree. Do you think that's what this verse is talking about? I don't think so. I mean, basically, it's using two extreme distances that says, I don't care where you go, God's going to get you. Mm -hmm. You could try to dig down into hell, which is as low as you could possibly get, or you could go up into heaven, which is as high as you could possibly get. It doesn't matter. You cannot escape God. That's what he's saying there. It's like saying as far as the east is from the west. not a distance of 20 feet in between. Well, if you go, if you climb up into that tree, or if you're down six feet under the earth, then God's going to get you from there. It's not what it's referring to at all. Uh, Jonah 2.2, 2, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Oh, wait a minute, another voice in hell? Huh. Oh. Uh, must just be more symbolism. Habakkuk 2.5, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Now we're going to get in the New Testament. Those are all the Old Testament references. And I'll tell you what, the New Testament references are even more clear than the Old Testament references. You're going to, you're going to, understand, and I, and I already started describing and quoting them ahead of time, but we haven't heard all the weeping and wailing and the worm dying not and all these other references that we are going to see in the New Testament. We didn't see that in the Old Testament. We definitely saw death and destruction. We definitely saw down. We definitely saw a lot of things. But we didn't get the full picture of hell even just from the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell, fire. And, mo and I'll tell you what, most of these references in the New Testament, it's Jesus Christ speaking. Not that that should even really matter because it's all the word of God, but literally Jesus Christ on this earth warning people about hell and calling it hell, fire, because hell is a place of fire. And what does fire do? Does it hurts. <laughs> it burns. Try sticking your hand over a flame. Yeah, there's people that do that for torture. It's a torture method. Burning people. Hell is a place of torture and torment. Not pleasant. Matthew 5, 29. Hell fire. And again, hell fire. That's not the common grave. There's not just fires all over the graveyards, right? I mean, it, I, I know that there are people who are cremated, but that's not the common grave. Hell fire. Matthew 5, 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it, is un, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Get the illustration, he's saying, Pluck out your own eye. Now, how much pain do you think that would be to pluck out your own eyeball? I mean, if you actually think about that for a second, that is pretty serious. You're going to go blind. You're going to suffer severely pain. He's saying, you know what? That is way better to have to go through that than to have your whole body cast in a helm. How could you say that's not a place of torture if it's way better for you to pluck out your own eyeball? Verse 30, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Again, cutting off your hand, plucking out your eyeball. Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Wait a minute, I thought the soul and the body were the same thing. Oh, wait, no. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew eleven twenty three, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell.
For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Again, hell has been referred to as having gates. A place, not a grave. Matthew 18, 9. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jehovah's Witnesses. Matthew 23, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? When you're in hell, you are damned. You are cursed. You do not just cease to exist. You are not annihilated. No, you are in damnation. You are damned. Here's a JW definition of Gehenna because Gehenna is also used and, and translated as hell in the Bible. So they refer to Gehenna, because Gehenna is in the, in the Greek, in, ca in case you didn't know, you know, we're called Sheol is in the Hebrew, Hades is Greek, and then Gehenna is Greek. And Gehenna is the one used typically in the New Testament. So we're going to see here their definition, because we're in the New Testament. So they say that Gehenna is just the Greek name for the Valley of Hinnom. Southwest of ancient Jerusalem, it was prophetically spoken of as a place where dead bodies would be strewn. There is no evidence that animals or humans were thrown into Gehenna to be burned alive or tormented. This is what they say, okay? This is not truth. This is just what they say. So the place could not symbolize an invisible region where human souls are tormented eternally in literal fire. Rather, Gehenna was used by Jesus and his disciples to symbolize the eternal punishment of second death, that is, everlasting destruction, annihilation. That's their whole definition of Gehenna and why you don't have to worry about it being hell because it's, it's just this reference to the Valley of Hinnom. Now, they also don't, you know, go and look up all the references. We're doing this to the Valley of the, 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 the children of Him, the Hinnom, the son of the, um, wow, can't speak where because that's the place where people were passing their children through fire and doing human sacrifice the valley of the son of Hinnom is what they're referring to here I knew I knew it come the valley of the son of Hinnom that's the place where these these wicked kings would literally pass their children through the fire unto Molech and unto their false gods and everything else so even if you're going to say that that's referring to this place, well, what are they doing in that place? They're literally burning their children through fire. It is a place. I mean, scripturally speaking and defined in the Bible of what this place was, it was a place where people are being burned alive. And they're just saying, well, that's not what it is. There's no evidence of it. Well, what evidence do you need? Obviously, you don't care about what the scripture says. They want some scholarly evidence. They want to go back to the Jewish rabbi scholars that reject Christ and say, tell us about this valley of the son of Hinnom. Did they really you know, offer human sacrifice there? Oh, no, no. Yeah, because I'm going to believe that from someone who denies Christ. When I have God's word telling me otherwise. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. It's never put out. The fire burns and burns and burns and burns and burns forever. Where is that in the Jehovah's Witness living on this earth forever? Where is that place? Where is the fire that's never quenched? It's never put out. It never stops. I know where it is according to the Bible. Because the fire that's never quenched right now is in hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And guess what? It's never going to be quenched. It's never going to be put out. It's not going to be on this earth. It's going to be in outer darkness. Mark 9, 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into fire, into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 47, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast 
into hell fire. Luke 10, 15, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. Luke 12, 5, but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed, <clears throat> hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 16, 23, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Yes, hell is a place of torment, of torture. Read all of Luke chapter 16. We don't have time to do that right now. I'm struggling to make it through this. <clears throat> Luke 16, you've got a story, not a parable, a story of a real person named Lazarus and a rich man. Lazarus dies and goes to heaven. The rich man dies and goes to hell. And immediately he lifts up his eyes, being in hell and being in torments, being tortured. You, don't, you may not like that. That's the God of the Bible, my friend. Get to know him a little bit. Read the scriptures and understand what this place is and what the judgment for our sin is. Not the common grave. Acts 2, 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Acts 2, 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, we're way over time, but I just want to make this point because there's so many people out there that want to still call us crazy because we believe that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. And when we say the word hell, we mean a place of torture and torment and fire and brimstone and sulfur and all that. That's what we're talking about. But see, people who want to reject that have to come up with some other place that's called hell. Now, in all of the references, we're not through everything just yet. We're almost done with all the references to hell. Did any one reference sound like a place where you would want to be? Not even one. Go back later and listen through all these verses again and see if any one time in the Bible, the King James Version, because there's people who are KJV only that want to say that Jesus Christ's soul did not go to hell. And hell meaning a place of fiery torture and torment. They want to say that. Then show me the one time in the Bible other than trying to point to this or point to Psalm 16 that hell is a place that you would like to go to. You're not going to find it. Because hell has one definition of its place, where it is, what it is. Weird doctrines want to try to redefine things and, and make up definitions for words and make up places and make up places like Abraham's bosom from one story in Luke 16 and just say, well, that's where everybody went in the Old Testament. Oh, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's not biblical. It's not scriptural. Acts 2 could not be any clearer. Speaking of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. If it wasn't left there, it had to be there. And if the punishment for our sins is hell, like Baptists will believe, and Jesus paid for our sins, why does it not make sense that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell? And that there truly was justice by the God of justice of our sins being paid in full, in totality. It only makes sense. And we have the scripture to back it up. James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. And I just want to make one notice, one more mention. You know, if you think about these other references of hell, the ones that might not sound so bad, well, they're going to be the opposite of heaven. But somehow, 
They're going to still want to tell you that Old Testament saints went to hell as, a, as the opposite of heaven. That's wickedness. That's a lie of Satan. I'm sorry. I preach an entire sermon on this for a reason. It kind of burns me, burns me up that people cannot believe what the scripture just says and just teach lies on something so simple and so easily understood. I grew up Presbyterian. Even the Presbyterians knew it. It was in the Apostles' Creed, right? And I'm not a Catholic, and I'm not a Presbyterian, and I don't believe in all these creeds and stuff, but it's something that's just so basic, simple, a Presbyterian can believe it. It's so evident. I mean, it's like the Trinity. It's just there. It's in Scripture. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Second Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to preserve unto judgment, that doesn't sound like a good place either. Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 6.8, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Oh, there's the Old Testament saints following death. Oh, wait, no, that's not it either. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation 20, 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Revelation 20, 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That is the last reference in the Bible of the word hell. And it makes sense that the most descriptive references to hell are found in Revelation, the book dealing explicitly with the judgment of God talking about the events that are happening with the judgment of God and being, you know, lake of fire. Revelation 14 is the last place I'll look at. And, and I've got so many more notes, but um, all right, I'm just going to have to, I'll go through as much as I can. Revelation 14, 9, referring to hell. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Remember, we mentioned that loving God, yet he also has wrath. And it's talking about people who receive the mark of the beast, that they are going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. This is something that I like to bring up to Jehovah's Witnesses because you can make up all kinds of other excuses. Let's narrow it down to just people who take the mark of the beast. Is this going to happen to people who take the mark of the beast? Because they don't want to say this happens to anybody. And fine, let's just say what this actually says right here is if someone takes the mark of the beast, are they going to be tormented day and night forever and ever and have no rest? Is that a true statement or not? Well, it's all just figurative. Yeah, you can, you can just say that the Bible is figurative all you want, and it doesn't make it so. The lake of fire, Revelation 19, 20, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with, with brimstone. Oh, it's just more symbolism. Why would it say they're cast alive into this lake of fire? It makes no sense. God is not the other confusion. God's not trying to lie to us. You know who is trying to lie? Someone's just going to try to tell you that every verse that they don't like in the Bible is symbolic. That's the person who's lying. That's the person who's perverting judgment. It's a sodomite that wants to tell you, Jesus would be okay with us. Jesus didn't say anything against sodomy. It's a lie. It's a lie. The Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that the beast and the false prophet are just symbolic. I read this from the literature. I read this from their website, from JW.org. They'll tell you that they're just symbolic. 
So then that would also imply, if, if the beast and the false prophet are symbolic, stay with me now. If they're symbolic, then people taking the mark of the beast is symbolic? I mean, it would have to be, because how could you take the mark of the beast if the beast is symbolic? What would that mark be? Well, it's just symbolic. Oh, okay, so then people taking the mark of the beast is symbolic. And I guess the performing of miracles to deceive people taking the mark of the beast, that's also symbolic. So at the end of the day, when you're looking at the book of Re Re Revelation, you could just say the entire book is symbolic and we don't have to answer any of these questions because it's just all symbolism. But it's the revealing, it's the revelation. Nonsense! And, and I, I pray and I hope that if a Jehovah's Witness ever watches this sermon, that they can, with a pure heart, just look it up for themselves and, and, underst and, just, and, and be willing to just want to know the truth and just be able to accept what the Bible says for what it says and not try to explain away every verse that you don't like. Just believe it. If it's God's word, just believe it. Just receive it. I'm going to call it there. I have a few more pages, but we're done. Um, hell is a very easy concept to grasp. But it's an important one. I mean, it's, it, it is the reason. It is the motivation for us to do the soul winning. It's one of the main things. It's, a, it's one of the main reasons we have joy for God saving us from such a horrible place. It is real. It exists. God is a God of justice. It doesn't mean he's not loving. It doesn't mean he's not merciful. But it is real. And it is a place where people are going to be cast into and spend all of eternity consciously being tortured and tormented where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I didn't even get into those verses because they didn't specifically use the word hell or they were in between verses that used the word hell. I didn't even include that because we're already at like an hour and 20 minutes into this sermon. So I got to cut it off somewhere. <laughs> I think you understand hell's real and that's not a good place to be. And that even when Jesus' soul went to hell, it wasn't a good place then, and it's never been a good place, and it never will be a good place. And we need to warn people about it. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the clear warnings that you've given us. God, help us to not be lazy, not to be slack, but to go out and warn people about this certain destruction. Lord, we know that you're not just going to change your mind. You've said it in your word, and it's true. And we believe it to be true, dear Lord. And help us to, to show other people their other ways. God, I, I pray that you would help us to have a humble spirit, to be able to, to, to show people the truth from your words, even if they're wrapped up into some false religion, into some cult, Lord, that, that you would give us the uh, presence of mind, give us the, help us to have the knowledge and the wisdom to approach these people, like I said, with humility, but to be able to just show them the truth and, and to show them the error of their ways, that, that the blinders can be removed, that they could call on your son and be saved, dear Lord. It's our sincere desire to see that happen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.